Welcome to the Hidden Bookcase. Come through and get cosy. Pick a book, your favourite book, that's the one that opens this room. Inside you'll find a warm fire, a loving cat, and a wide skylight to the stars. And a dangerously high to be red pile. I'm Morgan, I use they them pronouns, and I am the gender euphoria of a thousand fangs. I'm Soren, I use he him pronouns, and I am a trans bead lizard. We've been friends for over a decade and are always swapping books. Each fortnight we take it in turns to recommend one another a favourite read. The first time reader tells us what they know about the book, makes some predictions about what they don't, and then we discuss our thoughts with all of you book fans. This month is Disability Pride Month. So today, let's get to talking about... Hell Followed With Us by Andrew Joseph White. How did you come across this book, Morgan? And what is it about? I think I came across this book on TikTok or Instagram. I came across it last year. I just remember reading it on my couch at like 2am and just sobbing due to catharsis. It was really hard to get hold of in the UK though, which was annoying. US, UK publishing, please share your books. I beg you. I just want to read about the trans kids going feral. Hell Followed With Us is about trans boy Benji, who's been raised by an evangelical Christian fascist cult who have ended the world, and he is infected with a virus that will make him into a biblically accurate angel to lead the chosen into a new world and kill all the non-believers and he's like "Mm, no thanks and runs away and joins an lgbtq youth center and they murder everybody but like positive brackets positive (laughs) is there a lot of child murder that happens in this that gets glossed over quite easily yes i was thinking about that you know it's fine i've also been meaning to read it since hearing about and i think i also just heard about it on the internet but alas i was in the same boat and i could not find it and there was that whole thing with the pre-orders where those people had pre-ordered it and they still couldn't get it. People probably weren't expecting it to be as popular as it was, considering it's like an indie publisher and it's quote-unquote niche, whereas actually it's just the first time we've ever had a book like this anywhere near this topic. And so people are like, there's no call for gross trans horror and all the gross trans people are like, yes, please. <laughs> That's me on the cover right there. <laughs> Give it to me. I want to be a monster. Exactly. I just want more teeth. I want some teeth growing out of weird places. Why not? Why not? I mean, then you would have to brush them, though. So that's why not. I don't feel like Benji's brushing that often. I feel like in the apocalypse, that one goes quite fast. Yeah. Like, oh my god, it's my birthday. I get to brush my teeth. No, no. Your gums would get infected and stuff if you don't, especially because you're eating a weird apocalypse food. I feel like... Benji doesn't have to deal with infection anymore. No, maybe Benji's not concerned. <laughs> the non-monsters in the apocalypse should still be brushing their teeth if they can. That's what people don't think about. It's the toilet roll and it's the, the mm. toothpaste. Would you cut off somebody's ears for some toothpaste? Discuss. You know, I feel like I'd be that person who's like, okay, guys, we'll pick some people who never get their ears cut off. But if we cut off our own ears, then we'll get more when we're really desperate. I was thinking that. Especially when people are already dead. Exactly. <laughs> Let's be real, our main problem in the apocalypse is going to be the gluten. So we wouldn't even make it a week. Exactly. Shall we listen to my blind reaction? Hell Followed With Us by Andrew Joseph White. I am so excited. I've wanted to read this for so long that when it initially came out, it was available absolutely nowhere. It felt like it was insane. Could not find it. Morgan read it. Then we were like, we're definitely doing this for the show. So I couldn't read it. So I'm finally reading it. I know some things about it. The protagonist is a trans man, or trans boy, because I think he's like 16, called Benji, and the apocalypse has happened, and I believe he is slowly turning into a biblically accurate angel, hence the cover with all of the eyes and the wings. I think that there's like religious abuse in his backstory, like maybe he grew up in a cult or something like that. I know that the love interest is autistic, and the writer is also autistic, so I'm excited to see some own voices rep there. Um, and the writer is also trans, so excited to see only voices right there. Expecting horror vibes. I think, like, trans kids killing religious fundamentalists. I think that's sort of, like, the, the ambience that we're going for here. And do I have any wild predictions? I think Benji's going to kill his parents. That's my prediction. Well, he definitely contributed. Not to his father. Benji did not kill his dad. That was not on him. He contributed to killing his mother, but I'm only saying that because I feel like he would enjoy that. I didn't realise that the angels had triggered the apocalypse. I thought that maybe there had just been an apocalypse. You know what? I didn't question it at all, which is kind of like concerning. I didn't even question what caused it. I was just like, sure. Of course. Eco-terrorism apocalypse vibes is very on brand for right now. This book is very on topic. It feels like it's just getting more and more relevant, which is maybe... 
Not a good thing. This came out in 2022. I'm curious how much of it was written during the pandemic and how much of it was preceding it. I think it's very interesting that it was the queer kids who all mask and the Christians who all refused to do so. <laughs> the vanguard wearing them like just below their noses. Yeah, that makes sense. It reminded me a lot of the Maze Runner. Especially in the movies, it's very much like black goo dripping everywhere, veins, everything kind of falling apart and sort of like being semi-conscious the whole time. And also the virus is released by the government as a population control, but then there's also sun flares and it goes very, very wrong. Given the same sort of like, oh no, the real villain is the corrupt institutions. Mm. And the films also lean into that thing of one of the villains ends up having people who have been infected on leashes and using them as like muscle. Shall we talk about the cover? I was reading this at work and every single person who saw me reading it was like, oh my God, that cover is beautiful. The colour palette absolutely gorgeous it's so perfect all of the feathers and the chains and the flames and the broken buildings at the bottom if i hadn't known what this was about because i heard the pitch before i saw the cover i would still have picked this up in a heartbeat i love a lot of the covers that we get these days but the identical looking late teens early 20s girls Mm. that are on every single fantasy cover these days please (laughs) (laughs) we've moved on from A Court of Thorns and Roses original covers, please, as a society. To nitpick, though, because we have to on this show. Okay. Is Benji wearing a binder? Because he explicitly doesn't bind. Yeah. Maybe they were just like, oh, well, that's like the signal for trans boy. But I'm like, don't do that to him. If he doesn't bind, he doesn't bind. My brain's just like, I'm going to choose to believe that that's a sports bra, but it does not look like a sports bra. No, I look at that and I immediately think binder. I do like that the crucifix wounds, what are they called? There's like a special word for those, isn't there? Are on his hands. I do have a weird obsession with religious trauma in books. It's so good. Gideon the Ninth, religious trauma everywhere. Hell followed with us, religious trauma everywhere. I see it and I'm like, this is gonna be a good book. I think because it gets into themes that we both like, existentialism, why are we here, all of that stuff, often characters will have to confront that in a very meaningful way, especially in that Benji's coming to terms with the fact that he's never believed in an afterlife and he's never believed in at least a benevolent god. That's interesting character development. And then there's also the thing of, even if you didn't grow up religious, if you grew up in a country that sort of pushes religion, I sung hymns in primary school. My parents were like, yeah, you know, believe what you want, etc, etc. But I was still in little assembly talking about how great Jesus is every day. Woo. Yeah. What's that? Yeah, like at secondary school we had the Founders Day when like, yeah, you don't have to sing the hymns if you don't believe, but we're all getting together to celebrate the founder and he was Christian, so we're going to sing among the Christian hymns. And I used to be so proud that I knew all the words to Jerusalem, but why was that a thing? I mean, I was concerned about going to hell even though I didn't believe in God and even though I was not raised Christian because Christians would be like, yeah, if you don't believe in God, you're going to hell. And I was like, well, I don't believe in God. And then I had this like the reverse Pascal's wager problem where I was like, but I can't make myself believe in God, but what if they're right? And then I go to hell and I suffer for eternity, but I can't make myself do it. If I'm making myself do it just to not go to hell, then I don't genuinely believe it. So I think I was just overthinking it for like a six-year-old, but I was like that as a six-year-old. So, you know, the religious trauma is free if you're an overthinker. Yeah. You just do it to yourself. The whole thing of if God is all loving, then why would he send me to hell for not believing in him? Exactly. Just the internal inconsistencies. Speaking of internal consistency, Theo, his character was very interesting. He was saying to Benji, like, God made you trans on purpose. But then the rest of his cult didn't believe that. But he's like, I have to believe in something, so I'll put my entire belief into that. And when it goes wrong, I have to just cling harder. It's so easy to just be like, oh, if you give all your choices to something else, then life's easy. But then you have to dedicate yourself to that. Because otherwise, what was the point? Yeah. Which is so upsetting because he could have been so good. Exactly. And I appreciate very much that he didn't have that moment of like, oh, I was only saying that to get you back, to get Seraph back. He does genuinely seem to care about Benji on some level, but Mm. not enough. I absolutely cried when he gets turned into the little baby Grace at the end. (laughs) And Benji's like, what do you want with this world? And is like offering this kindness and the little baby Grace stays with him. Yeah. Oh my God, got me. (laughs) Absolutely got me. Benji understands, because he was so close to being the same. And I think that's interesting, that rift between Benji and Theo, the difference between Theo as a cis man versus Benji. Theo was like not so different that he couldn't slip under the radar. Obviously, he still suffers. We see people homophobically abusing him, but he's conforming enough to sort of get away with it. Whereas Benji kind of can't, so then he's not in this position, so he has to usurp. In a really bizarre way, Benji's kind of lucky because he's being forced to see through it so he gets out of it. Writing style. Writing style. What do we think? I really love how accessible it is. 
It's really like easy reading. It feels like it's itching my ADHD brain in the same way that Iron Widow did, mm. just flowing. There were certain bits where I was like, I feel like I've missed something here. How did you end up holding that note? Because I swear the last time Nick had that note and I don't understand how it got into your hands. But I also don't care. Because also, Benji's got literal brain rot. So if he's missing things, I can just put it down to that. <laughs> That's a good point. I liked it. I wasn't a huge fan of all of it. The normal voice, I sometimes felt was a little bit too didactic. There was a couple of things where I was like, we understand. Like a couple of parallels that were made explicitly. And I was kind of like, this is young adult, so I want to be like relaxed about it. On the other hand, I'm like, don't disrespect your readers. I think they can make those parallels. There was one line that bugged me, which was the moment where Benji is going to visit Theo and he takes the bobby pins out of his hair and he describes it as doing it like a housewife taking off her wedding ring before meeting up with her boyfriend. And I was like, fun mental image, I get it. But I think it would have been more effective if he had just taken them out of his hair and just left it at that. Mm. And then also the goal was just a lot for me. If you start at 11, you can't turn the volume up any further. And we definitely start at 11 here. Because it just got to this point where I was sort of just tuning it out because there was so much of it. And then I felt like it wasn't as effective as it could have been later down the line because mm. I was just so accustomed to it by that point, which I thought was a shame. I wanted to see him become more monstrous, but I was like, he's been throwing up sludge since the beginning. If he hadn't thrown up an organ until like halfway through the book, then it would have been so much more shocking. Mm. I felt like I wasn't reading it as gore in the same way that I would read gore in other books. Mm -hmm. It sort of felt less like gore and more like a metaphor for chronic illness. So you're so desensitized to it by the end. You're just like, this might as well happen. It just keeps happening and it gets worse, but you don't really notice it getting worse because you've become so desensitized to it by that point. So I think I was reading it in like a slightly different way. I think that's fair. I was thinking while I was reading it, is the desensitization the point? But I felt like it undermined some of the themes. You know, when somebody died or when moments of violence occurred, they weren't hitting. And I was like, I feel like these should be hitting because, you know, it's an important character or something. Mm. But I'm just sort of glazed over at this point because it's just what I'm expecting. I will say the environment that White depicts absolutely top notch the first scene in the church with all of the rainbow stained glass and then the white light peeking through where it shattered the sunlight and it glinting off everybody's robes absolutely gorgeous atmosphere going into this book the first time the only thing that i knew for certain happened in the book was that there was a sex scene in the church because our friend zoe who we've had on for gideon the ninth etc commented on their good read oh my god sex scene in a church slay or something like that i missed that oh my god so as soon as i saw a church come into it i was like how are we going to get here interesting i did like the difference in writing style from benji to nick mm, i love nick's pov i was like i want half of this to be nick's pov honestly i would have loved that the logical progressions in his thought processes are so clearly spelled out. Yeah, of course he's calling Benji it, because X, Y, Z, A, B, C. Because when I first got to that, I was like, mm, no, <laughs> no, how am I going to get through this? And then you get Nick's point of view and you're like, oh yeah, logic. Okay, this is still bad, but like, he's thinking it all through. And I just love him. I love him so much. Mm, Nick is so good. He's just autistic character who has meltdowns and hand flaps and goes non-verbal but is still the badass leader of the entire group but is also having major suppression issues and we get one happy stim moment when benji's like hey i'm sarah and i'm gonna kill everyone <laughs> in nazareth yes 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 Honestly, I think we've talked about autistic headcanons on here before, but I don't think we've actually had a canonically autistic character, which is so sad, but I'm so glad we have one now. More of this, please. The way he is accommodated by everybody and mm. has accommodations, even in the apocalypse. Yeah. It's so accepted that he's like, I don't like kissing. But then they have those like moments where the, f the forehead pressing, I love a good forehead press. And the last one, on like the very last page, when it's like so emotional and they're both like, we survived. And they're, they're forehead pressing. And Nick's got teeth growing out of his skin, but it's fine because now they're both corrupted, but they're also both whole and together. And oh my God. While I was reading this, I saw a tweet, I think, from Andrew Joseph White, where he was like, wow, I should write a cis love interest. That would be funny, right? And I was like, wait a second. Is Nick also trans? Which I assume no. I guess he could be. I don't think he is. I don't feel like he would keep it a secret if he was. Mm. I was just very confused because I saw that and I was like, have you not written one? Oh, non-binary nick i'm headcanoning it right now non-binary nick is solid i like that autistic people we don't have a gender we, we don't know what that is if you see through the matrix of social norms gender sure is one of them huh mm -hmm. 
On that subject, I really liked how Benji spoke about his dysphoria. He was like, it's not about how I am, it's about how how I am causes other people to see me. I thought that was a good distinction. People experience it very differently. But I liked that it wasn't just the classic, in inverted commas, narrative of like, well, I was born in the wrong body. He's like, no, it's just the fact that like then people see me and then they're like, oh, I'm going to make an assumption about you and it's not the correct one. It's really nice to see different forms of dysphoria because especially cis people reading these things for the first time will be like, oh yes, this is what dysphoria is. And you're like, that's not my experience actually. And they're like, no, because I've only read it like this. Especially with current conversations going on around medical transition and gender affirming care it was really nice and interesting to see a character who doesn't feel the need to bind a different version of what being trans can feel like because there is this monolith narrative that's being presented which is damaging to everybody on all sides actually yeah having multiple trans characters this came up a bit with lake law and in the watchful city it's just so nice for one person not to have to bear the whole weight of representation and you can see how multifaceted these identities can actually be yeah. Although I have to say, the ALK members, I was confusing so goddamn many of them, and I really feel like there were maybe too many of them. I think if there had been a smaller core cool group that Benji got more time to bond with one-on-one, -on -one, because as it was, I was just like, there's so many of you. And I was basically also in the state where I was basically remembering people by their identity, which I didn't really like, because I was like, oh yeah, Salvador Z uses ZZM, so that's what I remember about Salvador. Or, oh yes, that's the aromantic one. And I'm like, I don't want to be boiling them down to their identities, I'm sure they have more going on. But because there were so many of them, it was kind of like the only thing that I knew about them. Especially for the background characters, I feel like it wasn't actually important to know them. As terrible as that might sound, I feel like they were more there to be like, there are a lot of people who are still thriving here, there are a lot of queer kids. Benji knows their names, but you as a reader don't need to. You had the core people with the watch. And maybe it's because I've read it once before, so I was sort of really new going in. But I felt very connected to like Faith and Aisha and Salvador, whereas the rest are just sort of like to round out the cast. Yeah, no, I have to admit, I was confusing the Watch members as well, to be honest. Oh no. With this novel, I was kind of like, I wish this was either a short story and very condensed, mm. or a much longer novel, possibly with more points of views with Nick and maybe even Theo as well, getting a regular look. And also possibly more downtime, because with that like... If you start at 11, you can't turn it down. There were a couple of nice scenes in the arc where Benji got to bond with people, but I was like, if we had a little bit more of that, then I felt like that would have made the fight sweeter in terms of, you know, exactly what he's fighting for in that case. I mean, obviously, they're also going to have terrible times because it's the apocalypse. Very reminiscent of the first season of The 100. I have not seen The 100. Well, in the first season of The 100, apocalypse, you know, everybody's dying, very stressful, but their kids on their own for the first time in the apocalypse suddenly got free run and they're sort of trying to build this community and they do have these small moments of fun and enjoyment amid the absolute harrowing experience of being on the ground and trying to survive and it's really well balanced just sort of like they have bonfires like the one in the book with the deer but yeah i feel like this book could have done with more of those little moments yeah Introducing the Graces to the rest of the gang, or going out to just raid a shop instead of murdering people. Maybe break into a mall and let Benji pick his own clothes for the first time. I appreciate that there were like chores and then there was the wash, but I was kind of like, how does this work? Is someone mending clothes? Is someone washing clothes? What's going on here? I would have liked to see a little bit more of his daily life in the old. The new Nazareth people had it sorted. They had like a farming system. I appreciate that fighting for supplies and stuff is way more fun, but is that thing of when people fantasize about the apocalypse, everyone's like, and I would have a gun and I would go out there and I would kill zombies. And it's like, cool, somebody needs to like, do the laundry. <laughs> <laughs> I do find it quite funny how the ending is just kind of like, yeah, we don't need to do that anymore because we're just going to steal the gardens from New Nazareth and just, we know how to plant things totally. You all have to farm. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was thinking. I was like, is everyone good to be farming? Yeah. Also, don't turn your nose up at all those ears. Take them to the Vanguard. Take them for all they're worth one last time and then go to New Nazareth. I guarantee that New Nazareth does not have stuff like antibiotics. They don't believe in ruining God's plan. If you're going to die of an infection, die of an infection. Exactly. They probably don't have any painkillers. They have no alcohol. We've established this. So Yeah, the fact that no one had figured out how to make alcohol yet and it's been two years of apocalypse, I'm like, mm, I don't believe you. Where are the potatoes? Who's making the moonshine? Come on, the real questions. I want a sequel. Mm. I want more Nick. Give me dual POV. Please. I think Nick also needs to unpack his religious trauma. Oh my god, yeah. Benji already did this whole murder thing, so. You know, you mentioned it earlier. Did all of the kids in New Nazareth get killed too? That was what I was thinking about when I was reading it. I was like, oh. 
Because <laughs> you freaked out earlier, lads, when you killed like one guy who was like a little bit young. They seem to have killed everyone in New Nazareth. Yeah. That's the impression that was given. Yeah. And there are quite a lot of kids in New Nazareth. They've had no births in like, what, like mm. six years, maybe? Yeah. That means you could still have seven year olds. I didn't really address that at all. No, not just seven year olds. There are other positive queer kids in New Nazareth. There just are. Can't we just like take out the leadership and then be like, you can either stay or you can leave, but like we're in charge now? The murder was just so factual. There was like no other options given at any point yeah. in the narrative. <laughs> Which I'm a little bit like, not to be like, if queer people kill their oppressors, they're on the same level as them, because that's not true. But if you're killing all of your oppressors' children, and also elderly, and also infirm, and also the people who are probably scared and just going along with it because they have to, and giving them no chance to surrender. Now I'm wondering if we are kind of on the same, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Love the trans rage. Love Benji connecting to it. Love how it's explored as a thing that he was taught to suppress being raised as a girl, etc. He does deserve to lose his mind. He should fly off the handle, I agree. But you know what I mean. You'd need to make it slightly more black and white in order for it to feel okay for all that murder to happen. Maybe. I mean, like, if he murdered his way out of the labs and got all of the scientists, people are gonna die who don't deserve to die. You know, it's an apocalypse book. I'm not out here being like, we need to give everyone a nuanced and fair trial. You know, sometimes it's them or you. That's one thing. But again, it's just this thing of the random kids. Going back to the writing style for a sec, Benji, as a narrator, is so unknowingly funny. Because he's like, yeah, of course this is true, right? And you're like, Benji, my guy. Or something will happen and he'll just turn to the camera and be like, what the f***? He's just so amused by everything that happens. Just the constant maths triangles lady meme. He's so confused at all times and like, same dude. He's got a lot going on. I love him. So I like that he's like, I can't let anyone know that I was actually an angel or else they will out. And then he's been in the Alk for like two minutes and he's like, Faith, are you Christian? <laughs> it's like, what are you doing? I do love Faith. The arrow representation really jumped out. The weird little polycule on the side that was going on, I was like, this is my thing. We love poly characters. Yes. There should be more of them. Who was your favourite character? Nick. Unfortunately, it's not a hard question for this one. Yeah. I just love him so much. I love his points of view. Mm. I love the way that Benji sees him. He was slaying throughout the books. And also, like, he's got the gender that I want, which is clad head to toe in black, wearing a mask, floopy floppy hair, which needs a little bit of clips. It's all I want in life, so I simply must cherish him. Like a bead lizard. Like a bead lizard. I just hold him very carefully. I love Nick. I love the classic character, has to be strong for everybody else, mm. and then is also a complete mess. It's a good trope. It's very good. Who is your favourite character? I think it might also have been Nick. It was very refreshing to have a character who was explicitly portrayed as autistic, written by an autistic author, who also clearly understands that experience. And it's both something that, in inverted commas, doesn't limit him, but also is clearly something that he still has to deal with, because he has meltdowns, he needs to stim, and he needs to be alone, he goes non-verbal. It's that delicate balance, writing a character with a neurodivergence or a disability or a mental illness or whatever it is, and having it still be a part of their character but not their whole character. Mm. And I think it's struck very well here. But, you know, I'm a sucker for Theo because he's just messed up. Like, I don't like you, but I like you as a character because you're interesting. You decided that the genocide thing is correct, but the transphobia thing isn't. What's going on? I need to dissect your brain. What's happening? <laughs> I love Erin as well. Mm. She's just so awesome. She's just like... I am so out of my depth, but also I have to look after all of these kids because I've become a mother of 40 overnight. Here we go. <laughs> I love her. Pastel vibes as well. Mm. We love a pastel vibe. Yeah, I liked the, those little things about how people were embracing their gender presentation, but included in this landscape where nobody can medically transition because it is not viable to do so. Fun, fun, fun. But I think that was interesting, especially looping back to what we were saying earlier about the trans medicalist thing and you know how people will be like oh your gender isn't legitimate if you're not interested it's this weird level playing field almost nobody can do it and i'm sure there would still be issues of people who would be like oh even if we were back in the normal times and it was available to me i still wouldn't do it and other people would be like well that means that you're not because i want it every single day and i can't believe there was an apocalypse and i can't it's just interesting to take that speculative look because also i think the apocalypse has happened now so you kind of just should present the way that you want because the apocalypse has happened do you know what i mean why does gender matter now guys like, come on. It's all good. Like, surely it would lead to at least some people being like, okay, I'm going to start dressing. Weird. It's like when we went into lockdown and everybody came out with the most whacked out fashion sense for like a good six months. And so many people did realise they were trans in lockdown because they weren't being subjected to other people's 
gazes every day and they could just play around with their presentation. And even just having to wear masks. Yeah. I'm excited to see how the author explores transition in his second book. Because mm. I know that specifically for the cover, he was like, I want the main character to look more feminine. Yeah. Because it is set in like the 1800s. So there's not really any capacity for social change or social transition. And if we get a good haircut scene, you and me, we love a good haircut scene. Love a good haircut scene. We, we love it. I've got some quotes. Give me some quotes. First off, the gender of the moment where Benji just has like half his face missing after the confrontation scene with Nick. Mm. I saw some great art for that on Tumblr back when I first read this book. Oh my god. Mm. The vibe is immaculate. Just just to tr- put that out there. At least a face like this will make people think twice before making snap judgments about what I am. It's harder for someone to pin you down as a girl when they need a moment to pin you down as human. Yes. Ah, oh, that line when I first read this. Such a banger. I think White really tapped into something there because I exist on the internet with many trans people. I understand that we all like monsters and sometimes are like, wow, it'd be great if I had horns. I was just kind of accepting that. I wasn't really thinking about why, but I think that's a very interesting possible component to it. It's why so many trans people are like, oh yeah, my superpower is shape-shifting. Mm. Not even necessarily to shift genders, just to be like, yeah, what if I want to be blue today? What if I want wings? Yeah. That's another thing. Mm. You know what fits in here? Mm-hmm. We could have had like a non-sexual version of this. Wing kink. It was right there. I feel like Theo was very into the monster form, to be fair. He was like, you are my god made flesh. Yeah. Slay. I will worship at the altar of you. And I'm like, this dynamic in any other setting, with any other person, I would be so down for. But unfortunately... Benji's not having a good time, so it's not good. The other quote is at the wedding, which is almost a comedic moment. Imagine seeing this full-on monster and being like, yeah, that's a woman. Put it in a dress and get it married. Like, hello? (laughs) But also, how did Theo think that not telling Benji about his own wedding was a good idea? If you love this man, tell him you're about to marry him. You don't just spring the wedding on him. But yeah, the quote is, Do I have any part of me that still marks me as female? They have to be able to find it in something so they can assure themselves that there's a woman under all of this. Like there's a woman trapped in this flesh instead of a boy being this flesh. Mm. That resonated with me a lot because I've done a lot of writing about the ghost of the girl over the flesh of the boy. I've worked through that trauma in a lot of my poetry. Don't mourn the daughter who's quote unquote dead. Enjoy the son who is right in here. There's a lot of swearing in this episode, but I feel like there's a lot of swearing in this book. For a teen book? For a YA book? Yeah, maybe they were like, ah, there's already so much murder. If people are going to object to anything. I saw a review when I was reading this mm-hmm. that was like, the science and like the virus makes no sense. And I'm like, that's because it's magic? This is not a sci-fi book. This is very much religious fantasy. Mm. Well, not just urban fantasy, but still. Nature is goddamn weird and scary. The zombie ants are real. They make that parallel of Benji's organs dissolving as the caterpillar dissolving in a cocoon to become a butterfly. Mm. I was like, yeah, I can kind of see it. I appreciate that it is obviously leading into an area that does seem difficult to believe in. And then Benji's having all of these weird visions. But at the same time, in this fight with Theo, who appears to be in this strange dream space, you could also read that as a metaphor. It's like soft magic systems, but for sci-fi. It's like a soft sci-fi system. Just go with it. Sci-fi is actually just magic systems, but like in the future. Yeah, I mean, sufficiently impressive technology is indistinguishable from magic. The other criticism I saw whilst I was reading this book is somebody who'd written a one-star review who was like, I could have done without reading half the Bible in this book. What did you expect going in? A first-person narrator who's been raised in a cult has literal brain rot and is unlearning his own Christian upbringing and also is noted as somebody who's really good at learning scripture and memorising it because he's kind of a little bit of a theatre kid at heart. Yeah. When you are raised in that sort of environment, everything is somehow linked back. Yeah. And also, it's his coping mechanism. It has been for ages, and he's in a really stressful situation. So he's going to fall back on it, and he does, repeatedly. Soren, as the new person to this book, final thoughts? I definitely had a very good time, and I'm so glad I finally got to read this, because I've been waiting. I think this is a very complimentary three for me. There are lots of things about it, in terms of pacing, in terms of character development. I wanted to care more about Benji than I did. I wanted to care more about everyone than I did, but it was just such a tidal wave that I found it difficult to connect. And there were elements of it that just kind of chafed with me. And I think a lot of that is personal. I do want to say that I'm not a big gore fan. It's not usually my favourite part of horror. And even then, I feel like I need it very sparingly. So that is definitely a personal element of it that just wasn't 
great for me. But I had a very good time. I would still definitely recommend this. I love The Queer Rage. I'm definitely reading more of Andrew Joseph White stuff. Morgan, can you give us your final thoughts? My final thoughts are incredible vibes, basically. I think when I first read it, my review was like, it's messy and it's unhinged. And like messy is a little bit talking about the characters and also the gore and also the writing style. Overall, that wasn't a negative for me. That's fair. I definitely on a second read, I was a bit more like, there are some editing issues here. It needed like just one more round. But at the same time, it was so refreshing. It was so cathartic. Mm-hmm. It itched in a place that I didn't know I needed. And it said so many things. I was like, yes, you get it. I've never seen this before. It was so unapologetic. So it's a five stars from me. The vibes were just off the charts. I'm so happy that trans teenagers can pick this off a shelf. I am so amazed that this got published. Yeah, honestly, especially traditionally. If it had been self-published and then taken off, that would have made sense. But the fact that this was traditionally published in the first place is shocking. It gives me hope for the future. If people liked this, do you have any recommendation? Okay, so I'm going to be horrible and I'm not going to mention an actual traditionally published book. I'm going to mention Shoot Around by Suspoo, which is a webtoon, and it's complete, so it's all there, all available through for free, which is about an all-girls basketball team who are together when the zombie apocalypse starts, and it's about them and their coach trying to survive the zombie apocalypse. It has loads of queer rap, loads of trans characters, basically all of the characters are people of colour. It's got Polly. It's got horror. It's got everything. I love it. You should definitely read it. It's severely underrated. The second thing that this reminded me of so much is, again, not a novel, but an audio drama, Hello from the Hallowoods by William A. Wellman. Particularly Percy's narrative. It's religious abuse. It's people trying to create weird rituals in the name of God, who are your family. It is being a trans boy and maybe not being able to transition because you are turning into something else or you haven't turned into something else. I don't want to give too many details. It's about the very weird magic system. If you love this, you will love Hello from the Hallowoods. And that has two for two romance, basically. Does Degree Graves count as trans because they're they them, but like because they're multiple people? I would say yes. They're not cis. Let's say that. Do you have any recommendations? Even though I recommended this on our last episode, The Silt Verses does again fit into the vibes, which is an audio drama about different gods and religious fanatics turning other people into horrifying, sanctified beings in the names of gods, which feels very similar. I guess I will recommend The Maze Runner. Don't read the books because James Dashner is a huge misogynist and actually the movies are much better. I feel like I should recommend a book. I mean, Gideon the Ninth, if you like religious trauma and gore, I feel like I recommend it too often. But it's so good for this one because of the religious trauma and the horror and the existential questions and the questions about faith and loyalty. It's very similar. I am going to recommend something that is so tendentially related. Vespertine by Margaret Rogerson. It's hard to explain why this connects in my brain. The main character isn't canonically autistic, but also she's so autistic. It's like set in a world that's sort of post-apocalypse, but also medieval times when the dead are sort of wandering around as spirits. The main character has grown up as a nun and has the sight and was possessed as a child and is supposed to be going off to do her studies. But she's like, no, I just want to be a nun and I just want to prepare bodies because I don't like talking to people. No, thank Thank you. And then she gets possessed by a revenant who's like, damn girl, you live like this? And teaches her things like how to react to when she's in pain, how to go to sleep, how to eat food. And it's like so healing. So after the gore of this book, go read Vespertine and just enjoy being looked after by a thousand year old revenant. Wow. It's great. On July 31st, we will be chatting about disability representation in science fiction and fantasy in general. For that conversation, we have joining us the wonderful Elle from ERM Reading on TikTok. They do a lot of videos about disability representation in fiction, and they very kindly said that they would come talk to us. Until then, you're always welcome through the bookcase. Don't forget to scratch the cat on your way out. Thank you for listening to The Hidden Bookcase, a production of Planar Prod. On this episode, you heard Morgan Greensmith and Soren Brywood discussing Hell Followed With Us by Andrew Joseph White with editing by Kit Lovick. You can find out more about this book at andrewjosephwhite.com, and you can find White on Twitter at AJWhiteAuthor. You can find The Hidden Bookcase on Twitter at Hidden Bookcase, and on Instagram, Facebook, Tumblr, and TikTok at Hidden Bookcase Podcast. Find out more about Planar Prod at planarprod.com. Know what we should read next, or want to chat to us about what you thought of this episode's read? You can reach us at thehiddenbookcase at gmail.com, or chat with us on our Discord. The link's in our show notes. If you're enjoying The Hidden Bookcase, please consider leaving us a rating or review, or you can always tell a friend how to find us. Your whispers are the best way for bookworms to discover our show. On our next episode, which will be out on Monday, the 31st of July, we'll be discussing disability representation in speculative fiction, alongside special guest L, better known as ERM Reading, on TikTok and Twitter. We hope to see you then, and in the meantime, you're always welcome through The Bookcase.